Welcome back to the manor. Julian McBain here, and we are back with migration. End up with the only 14 in the area. That figures. Ha! Huh. So, all right, before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome to the manor. Please take a moment and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time, so make sure you subscribe. Also, consider going to patreon.com slash Julian McBain if you want to support my work. If you do, you'll get exclusive content, including videos and my ebooks. Okay, so I'm glad to be back on the road to migration. Not on the road to migration, on the road of migration. And uh, I was actually thinking about. Oh, looks like I'm going to have to locate the 19s. That's okay. Um, thinking about what to do once migration ends. And it's a tough call. You know, do I go, do I go to Cyrene like I traditionally have? Which is generally what I do, and I'm, I'm leaning that direction. Or do I go to Monria, which I have not visited all year? I mean, in the long run, of course, I can do both, right? I can go to Cyrene for a while and then f maybe finish the year out on Monria. Um, I know that there's going to be a mayhem between that now and then. There's a group of pistoliers. Are these guys all in, like, the same society or something? No? Definitely not. Hmm. Oh, well. So, just trying to figure out where to go after this is over. And part of me le is leaning toward Monria because I can actually hunt on Monria and completely break even. Or even make a very tiny profit through selling for markup. It's hard. It's, I mean, you, you're talking hours upon hours of hunting Shoggoth, right? It's not hunting the shubs. But I can do it. The alternative is going to Cyrene and doing the same thing with the low levels there. Um, although the Eliminated... Let's see, the Panleons are still there and the Merfolk... Oh, the Dusters. They, they got rid of the low level Dusters. So it'd mostly be hunting probably Panleons, which is fine. I can complete the Panleon and the Merfolk in dailies on a day-to-day -day basis. And that would actually work out really well. And Cyrene has a very favorable loot table as well, so that might work out. But I'm going to come to that decision as migration, because I don't know how much longer migration goes on. I don't know that they are winding it down yet, which is good, because I'd really like to get through the Take a Breather quest. Um, bulletin, latest buzz, oh, events, uh, they haven't updated that since Easter Mayhem, really? There, I'm just going to do like a Google search. Oh. 2021 migration season. Ha! Huh. No, everything is still... Everything is high, but the trend is starting to go down, which means they're starting to get ready to wind it down. Probably by the end of August. If I remember correctly, migration usually ends at the end of August. Or toward the end of August. So, my goal is to make it through Take a Breather. Just capitalize on these dailies as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, real life means I don't get to do it every single day, but I do it as much as I can, and then um, just go from there. And figure that out. So that is your Entropia update from Julian McBain. And beyond that, coming up with a topic today is, is kind of tough, because I've I've been playing. I've been prepping for a um, a family gathering, which is 
was actually due to start half an hour ago, but circumstances that the people coming are going to end up being late. And it just occurred to me that it's been like two years since my family's been up because of COVID. And just remembering what family got, like just being able to have a family gathering again. It should not feel so novel, and yet it does. And uh, I just, I find that very interesting. That, you know, I we woke up and we, we got everything together and it just felt very novel that we were going to have family up. Because for a long time, you couldn't. You couldn't travel. And most of my family lives in another state. So, and with Vermont, Vermont, like, locked itself. It, they, they had a Vermont is safe for Vermonters policy here. So, basically, it was, if you come into the state, you're required to quarantine. If you leave the state, you are required to quarantine when you come back. The only exception were for specific types of people who work across the border. So, like... If you go into New Hampshire, there's a lot of people who live in Vermont but work in New Hampshire right along the river. And so they were allowed to travel for work, but they were only allowed to go to work and come back. Um, and it was just, it was rough. It was a pain. I mean, I understand why they did it, but that doesn't make it less of a pain. You know, two things can be true at the same time. It completely makes sense why they made the decisions they made. And there's, and... It's true that it's a pain in the ass. I mean, sometimes that's just the way life works. And, uh... It was... Because of that, um, because you have to do the two-week quarantines and stuff like that, my family couldn't come up. And... We couldn't go see them, because once you... Like, I saw I saw my father once during the, pan, the, the prime... I know we're still technically in the pandemic, but we're in the, the waning months of the pandemic. During the main part of the pandemic period I went and saw my father once on Christmas and we had to lock down for two weeks it was just and and, and my father we like we didn't stop anywhere we just went to his house and my father has an immunocompromise so he was like not messing around but we still had to follow the rule and and I get it but at the same time it's like uh and I'm just glad to see that that's all going away finally. Um, and th this this family gathering really kind of marks for our family the end of a long, drawn out, dark couple of years. Even though you know there's still the cleanup to do, there's still things going around. Um, it's a good sign that we're able to do this again. You know, family is a strange thing. You're you're related by blood, and you're related by... When you grow up together, you build a culture. Like, there's a family culture to every family. But it's, it's not intentional, per se. I don't think it is. And family that you couldn't stand as a child, you may think get along great with as an adult, and vice versa. And I think that's actually fairly common. I think it's common because your priorities as an adult shift dramatically from when you were a child. And, and I think there's some utility to that. Because understanding how you change as you mature helps you to raise your own children. But you have to be aware of how you change as you mature in order to look at your child and say, Oh, I remember this time period in my life and this is how they handled it and this is how I need to handle this. And you build that culture with your family. And depending on what family lives, there might be significant differences in family culture between, let's say, nuclear units. So most families are nuclear families. And so you have the parents and you have the children. And occasionally you might have a grandparent living there too. Like my family used to be four generations in a single house. Now we're down to three, unfortunately, um, not due to COVID. And... the the nucleus of the family is my parents and so that nucleus is kind of the center of where the household's culture is 
and then um you know generally speaking when the children move away they become parents tradition you know in history historically speaking that's generally the case and of course you know the the millennial and the millennial generation and the gen z is is much less likely to operate like the oh, fuck operate like this but it still happens and um you know they oh fuck are you serious i can't afford this This is annoying. This is really friggin' annoying. Of course I would hit the level 29. Why wouldn't I hit the level 29? I'm gonna die. Yup. Nope. We're going back to a revive. I can't fight two of them at once. And that's just wasting money. Um. What the hell? Oh. Oh. Apparently, I'm over the hill. Um, lost my train of thought there when I died. Which, you know, is kind of a natural thing to do, you know? Oh, I lost my train of thought. What happened? I died. Oh, okay. <laughs> this cliff's going to be in the way, isn't it? Ah, damn it. Oh. Fruit. A karoot. I'll take the elevator. Um, but yeah, so you build you build your culture around the nuclear family, and then the culture of the extended family. So like the the each parent brings into the relationship the culture of their parents, right? And there are things that they want to do the same, and there are things that they want to do differently. And this is how society evolves as as parents, as, as children grow into parents and change the way that they raise their own kids based upon how their parents raised them, usually just in subtle ways, right? It's like, well, this little piece didn't work out very well, so I'm going to do that differently. And I think there's a lot of utility in that. And so they do that. And over time, it iterates itself over and over, and that's how society develops. And the value systems change over time. And I think that we've seen, I think that the, the proliferation of information across social media and many different spheres have actually accelerated social drift and how people operate. And I haven't decided whether that's good or not because it's, it's done a lot of good things. Um, it's done a lot of good things. It's allowed people to... Um, it has allowed people to live their lives in a way that they are much more likely to live the way they want to. And things that were taboo only 20 years ago are no longer taboo. And in a lot of cases, those things are good. That's a good thing. Um, because it allows people to live their life in a manner where they, they feel the most fulfilled. Now, that being said, there's a good argument stating that, you know, happiness happiness should not be the goal. And I, and I firmly believe that. But I don't think fulfillment is necessarily happiness. So I don't think happiness is necessarily fulfillment. Fulfillment is finding meaning in the life that you lead, even if the life is tough. And life is rough. And finding that meaning is important. Um... And, but with this, this huge amount of social drift, I feel like it also, it's multiplied the good exponentially, but it's also multiplied the bad. And I think that's why there's so much rage now. Like, everyone's pissed off. And they're pissed off at random shit. And I think this is actually the, this might have been the, the foundational cause of the toilet paper incident, which, which was... Looking back, it was fucking hilarious, but that was a problem. <laughs> like, when I tell my grandkids about 
how all the toilet paper disappeared at the beginning of COVID. They're going to be like, why? I'm like, well, I guess toilet paper feels better than an 8x11 glossy, right? But they won't even know what that means. <laughs> what do you mean? No, that's right. Grandpa had magazines that were on actual paper. Um, and the, the fact that that's more true than I ever thought it would be is just, it, it gives me more gray hair than I've already got. You know, when I, when I was a kid, I thought, you know, maybe I, by the time I'm an adult, we'll be reading books on tablets like they do in Star Trek. And in my college years, um, before smartphones were even a thing, I, I wrote a book with my ex-wife where books were read on, we called them computer pads, they were tablets. They hadn't been invented yet. And then not 10 years later, we've got tablets and I can have whole libraries downloaded and at my fingertips. And that came to pass. And, and I have the feeling we're going to see a slow reduction in the amount of, the, of printed books. And I think it's already started. A lot of things have gone digital. I think that the reduction in printed works has already started. But the bookmaking industry is too large to just disappear. And there is a lot of good in having actual printed materials. Because then the thing about having an actual book is you can read it even when there's no power. And you can be like, well, if, if you've got battery, well, yeah, batteries are limited in scope. They will die. And if you're constantly using a device, they will die faster rather than slower. And so because you have the physical book and you're able to read it whenever you want, no matter what the circumstance, so long as there is a light to, to read by. And you're like, well, you need electricity for the light. Not necessarily. I have read by gas lamp. I actually really enjoy reading by a gas lamp. I've read by fire. It's a very, it's actually a very interesting experience reading a book by flame by the light of a flame and i wouldn't use candles for this although you could use several um like tea lights or something of that nature to generate enough light although i warn you if you're using enough tea lights to see well reasonably well you're going to get really freaking warm they put off a lot of heat when there's like a dozen of them um it's actually a good way to heat your home in the event there's an emergency not it won't bring it it won't stop things from getting too cold, but it'll definitely reduce the, the sharpness of it. Um, but anyway, the, the things that we have now, I think that the, I think that the proliferation of information has done a lot of good. And I think it's done a lot of bad. And it's, the, it's that rage I spoke of that I think is the most bad. And, and part of it's because there's a, an element of, satisfaction when we're able to rage at something and the way social media is designed it's to amplify that rather than to mitigate it and so I think that's why I think that's why emotions have become so catastrophically overwrought lately you know people aren't in control of themselves anymore because they get the dopamine hit when they post something and People pile on and they like it and they comment and they agree. And when there's dissent on any given subject in a, in a particular thread, you get the people who pile on them. And it gives you that dopamine hit. And I think that's the problem is that we're getting, we're addicted to the dopamine of social media. And I don't know how to account for that because social media has become a... a it's almost become a foundational technology. It's systemically important to the way we communicate with each other. And that's a frightening thing because the social media companies, there aren't that many of them. They're essentially a monopoly or they are a, they're not a monopoly, although they are because each one in, um, has occupied a singular space where they are massively dominant. And there is a, um, a very cultural uh, motion to prevent other spaces from popping up and and some of the reasons they have are good and some of the reasons they have are bad but 
the monopolization it creates because you've got the 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 major tech platforms all have their spot that they have essentially monopolized and by doing so they have cartelized themselves because no one else can break into the space um, at least not easily and not readily and now uh, to be fair part of it's because they were they, they built the best that there could be at least that's far as i can tell you know you can't get a better um connection social media platform than facebook for keeping in touch with families or organizations it's just there's a reason they beat myspace during that particular war and i'm telling you i was a myspace guy i was in it for i was in it to win it for tom but that when MySpace lost that particular war, Facebook became essentially a monolith. They could not be touched. And then Twitter came along and they did their microblogging thing. And that was a very interesting phenomenon, 140 characters. And then, of course, they doubled it because they realized that 140 was w way too little. Um, but the, the utility of, of Twitter to connect with people worldwide cannot be understated. It's ability, like, there are people that I follow on Twitter. There are people who follow me on Twitter that I never thought would ever follow someone like me. Like, I am, in, in my own opinion, I am small apples, right? I am not a major player in any sphere. But I've got people following me, and, and it shocks me that they would they would bother with me. And it's like, holy crap, this is like an ego boost. Um... And so, but it, there, there's the dopamine hit though, right? You see that you see the person that you you follow because you like what they say and admire the work they do, and when they follow you back, there's an instant hit of dopamine, and you can ride that wave of dopamine for quite some time. And uh, or is it dopamine or serotonin? It's an endorphin rush. Um, okay, so the, yeah, it's it's the pleasure center, but it gives you that endorphin rush, that dopamine hit, and I might actually, I might be confusing the two. I am not a doctor, nor am I a a, a psychologist, but. If I, I believe I am getting this one correct, where it's a dopamine hit, and you want that over and over because the withdrawal from it just sucks. No. The only thing I love more than, than that type of, or anyone, you know, like for me, when looking for, when looking for those things that, that make me happy, the only thing that would beat out anything that can cause a dopamine, that's why we play video games, right? The You get the, the dopamine hit. When you when you level up, when you beat the daily, when you you get the sound and the noise and the endorphin rush comes in, um, adrenaline is probably the only greater naturally occurring. Um, I hate to call it a drug, but it's like a drug. It's a it's a it's a chemical. It's a it's a naturally produced chemical, and. I know for me, adrenaline beats out anything else, and that's why I'm a sports fighter. That's why I was a firefighter. You know, you get that. Your heart starts to pound, and you get the the feeling, the rush feeling, and you get nervous, and you get excited, and it's all the same feeling, and it's all piled in, and you're about to go do something intensely dangerous. Like, um, probably the most dangerous situation I've put myself into on purpose and this is after I was a firefighter. I had left the fire department to move halfway across the country. A guy walks into my store. He, he, he was like known for driving really old pickup trucks, right? Old, old trucks. And he always parked in the same spot. And as it happened, that spot was right next to the propane tanks that we had. And he pulls in. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, it's him. And, and he walks in. He goes, do y'all got a fire extinguisher? I'm like, well, why? He goes, my truck's on fire. And I'm like, this guy's parked in front of the propane tanks. So, and this is what I was told happened. 
Because the next thing I know, I'm standing between the truck and the propane tanks, the fire extinguisher having already been fired. Okay. And this is not the only time that something like this has happened, but... I'm standing there, and I walk back in, and I said, is everyone okay? And they were like, yeah, they're, they're like, are you okay? I said, yeah, why? He goes, he said his truck was on fire, and you jumped the counter. Because I was working at a convenience store. And we didn't even see you grab the fire extinguisher on your way by. So apparently I busted, so the fire extinguisher was next to the door. And apparently I hit the door and grabbed the fire extinguisher on the way. Which, it was supposed to be latched to the wall. So I'm still not entirely sure how I got it out without damaging anything. Adrenaline's a hell of a drug. <laughs> we need to kill one more. Still do. But the more you do it, the more you'll seek it. You know, the only reason I don't actively seek that adrenaline rush all the time. Like when I was a firefighter, I looked forward to it, right? Two o'clock in the morning didn't matter to me. Tone me out, get in the turnout gear. I actually never got to respond to a live fire. I was, um, I primarily did crash rescue of which there were a number of them. Um, and of course the two actual fires I would have been on the hook for, I was on planned scheduled vacations out of state both times. One of them, I was driving back I get toned out. We're still an hour and a half away. I get home. I drop my, um, not my ex-wife, but my wife at the time. And our infant son, who is now 13, at home. And I tear off to the, to the fire station. And I run in and I'm like, and I, and I get a status and half the, the, the crew is there. Because the fire had taken out a, um, an auto body store. And they were there were seven departments responding because there was no water available. They had to just keep sending tanker trucks, and they were rotating. And so I got put in rotation for the next crew to go out. And just as they were getting ready to refresh the crew, they said the fire was out, and they and they sent and they dismissed us all. So that was a very interesting time. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time. So make sure you subscribe. And there's all... Oh, hello. Excuse me, sir. This is a Wendy's. And as always, I appreciate the support. And we'll see you in the next one.